Hello and welcome to the Joy of Deving with Bob Hess. And uh, once again, uh, we welcome you. Uh, this will be the fourth episode and um, we're super excited to have you. Um, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be going over uh, various topics in content development and also continuing our process and, uh, you know, getting a chance to uh, look over some of the tools that we use here internally at SSG and on Dungeons and Dragons Online. Super excited to get a chance to uh, get an opportunity to show all this stuff off. Uh, there's been a whole bunch of really exciting things going on behind the scenes, and um, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, as always, if you have any questions regarding content development, any of the tools that I'm using, uh, some of the stuff that's going on regarding content development, please let me know. Uh, this is not a stream about systems design. It's not a stream about uh, balance stuff or any of those types of things. Uh, that's not what I work on, and that's not really uh, the theme of this. Um, and so there are other streams which sort of handle those topics uh, with uh, Severlin and, and some other folks. And so um, this is not that. So anyway, um, to kind of go into it, uh, I'm going to kind of go for what we're going to be doing for today's stream. Let's take a quick look. And for today's stream, what we're going to end up uh, be covering or a series of different things. Uh, in this case, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look over the uh, the dungeon shell updates. Uh, essentially, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over a whole bunch of what I have done for the dungeon shell. Uh, I have a couple of different videos that I'm going to show you regarding that, um, just so you can kind of see sort of the transformation on the sort of the weeks between of the live streams of sort of the progression of work that I've done while I've been working on this uh, this dungeon and also, uh, as discussed last time, uh, also working on the legendary chronoscope stuff. Um, this week, most of the work that I'm going to be doing, will, or at least all of it, uh, unless something uh, significantly changes, uh, will be having to deal with uh, the Kitty Dragon dungeon and the pack uh, that was presented from pack stuff. And so what we're going to be doing today for the most part, will be, let's see, uh, it will be, I'll be going over Dungeon Shell updates. I'll be showing you a little bit about how we script NPCs in this case. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to hop into uh, our world building tool and uh, setting up uh, an intro conversation uh, uh, dialogue. And so you can kind of see some of the bits and pieces that we use as a portion of our scripting stuff. I'll be going over uh, dungeon triggers and essentially how we go about um, having dungeon events and different pieces from the uh, dungeon quest uh, interact with the space. And then also uh, putting in a little bit of dungeon text and so you can sort of see the beginning of the process as I'm building. Um, so let's take a quick look. Um, what I'm going to do is in the background, I'm going to show you some video that I took of sort of uh, when I was working, uh, this is me working, uh, showing you after changing a few things about the, the, the setup that I had shown you in the previous, uh, the previous week, this essentially shows the expansion of the dungeon, uh, and at least the dungeon shell of it. And I kind of wanted to go over, uh, just kind of give you a quick fly through and give you an idea of sort of what the dungeon looks like now. Um, I did a little bit of pre-recorded stuff for this. Hopefully it looks, uh, uh, hopefully it works pretty well and, uh, we can go from there. All right. Um, so the next thing I'm going to show is going to be a quick overview of this. And what this is, is just showing rather than kind of flying around just a, a quick this is what I had done to the shell. This is sort of how I moved it around. And this is sort of how I expanded different pieces for different uh, portions. One second. Can't go down here. Give me one second while I bring up the next video. Um, what I'm gonna show you now is a fly through of me uh, showing you what we have done or what I had done as a portion of the actual deco for the game. Um, what this is, is essentially I took different pieces as I discussed in a number of different times, 
uh, and essentially covered the walls and started making it feel a little bit more like the marketplace. In this case, uh, using a whole bunch of different marketplace assets and essentially just trying to give you the sense that you are in fact in at least one of the wards somewhere in Stormreach. You're bopping around and you can kind of see a lot of the common architecture. This I'm kind of floating around and flying around and showing a little bit of the different pieces uh, as we went. Um, you can see that there's a couple things for up top. Now this is a really preliminary pass. I haven't done a lot of the different stuff on top. I haven't done a lot of the, the decorations uh, regarding, uh, I haven't done a lot of the decorations for a good portion uh, of what we're ending up doing. Uh, let's see. And the last thing I'm gonna show you is actually the process of me taking one of these small pieces and uh, decorating it. Uh, now, I showed a bunch of this the last time we uh, that we kind of looked over it. And just give me one second while I get that put together. Let's see. All right, here we go. Now, this next video, as I was mentioning, is essentially me putting together sort of the facade portions uh, of the dungeon. Uh, as you can see, what I'm doing is I'm selecting and grabbing different pieces. I'm using some of our tools to rotate and sort of do the specific setup of the different pieces and sort of combining them in the fewest pieces as possible to sort of cover the walls and make it look like more like the marketplace or any sort of living city. A lot of our different spaces are built this way uh, just because it gives us uh, the edges and the borders and stuff like that kind of give us a framework of what we're going to be doing and also have some sort of engine considerations. They uh, provide occlusion and uh, stuff to, to help with performance. And so uh, as we build through this, essentially trying to make this feel like a moving and sort of living portion of the city, uh, this is a little bit of what I did. Um, so one of the nice things about our system is that we can do a lot of really easy grouping objects. We can uh, rotate them. We can also uh, change uh, the position of them and also uh, removing or leaving stuff out or deleting stuff can go pretty quickly. It just takes a little while to get used to sort of uh, how it goes. One of the things that we have to be careful when we're doing this sort of stuff is a concept uh, called Z fighting. And uh, essentially, if you see different pieces of our uh, terrain flicker, and you see that from time to time. Um, there's some small adjustments that we need to do while we're going about it. But uh, in this case, what I'm trying to do is trying to make it look as if this is a contiguous wall. Uh, it's kind of great that we get the opportunity to do this just because it gives us a um, kind of gives us a really good uh, understanding of the different pieces that we have uh, involved. In this case, I'm using a lot of the the redone market uh, uh, assets that we have. We have a, we have a wide array of different things that we have, uh, from DDO that we built for the game. And so we're just kind of going from piece to piece to piece, putting it over and sort of covering the edges of one of those walls that I showed you when I did an initial, uh, thing. I'm sorry about the, uh, set the, uh, shaky camera work, but you know, that's sort of how it goes when you're trying to record these and I'm still getting used to a little bit of that uh, as I'm sort of showing. But as you can see, uh, I have done as you can see, I did a bunch of different work and essentially was able to put together a, a more or less basic outline of a good portion of what we're doing. All right. Let me go to this. Uh, the next thing I'm going to show you is actually in-game client. Uh, I'm going to do a quick run around uh, so that we can take a look to see, um, uh, so that we can actually uh, get a chance to see what it looks like in client when we're uh, attempting to uh, play through the space or look through the space. It'll just take me a few seconds to get that up for you. And this. Uh, I've always wondered if architectural assets are based on tours of European or Middle Eastern cities. Um, 
I am uncertain where the art department has gotten uh, ideas of some of these things. Some of it is from WotC uh, pieces or at least WotC information that they've given us. A lot of the setting stuff is from from the from uh, different artwork that they provided for us as as inspiration of what we're doing. But also some of it is, in fact, for that sort of thing. Um, all right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hop into. Uh, I'm going to hop on into our client. And as you can see, uh, I'm going to be going in as uh, my barbarian. It'll be just a few seconds while I uh, go ahead and load up uh, the entire uh, setup. So anyway, um, let's see. Uh, one of the things that I really do like is that because we have a, a wide array of different settings and we have a wide array of different areas, we have an opportunity to do uh, a great amount of depth of decision making when we're doing architecture and when we're doing pieces like that. And so the people which are which are environmental artists really knock it out of the park. Everything from uh, the way that uh, the way that Sharon looks versus the way that Ravenloft looks and uh, their ability and understanding of sort of how to build uh, different pieces for this engine really kind of does shine through in some of those cases. Uh, let's see. I'm going to load into I'm going to go ahead and load into the distance or into the thing. You can see that it's called catastrophe. Uh, this is right now a placeholder screen. Um, and as it comes through the placeholder screen, uh, you can see a number of different things. One of the things that you can see is that um, the basic uh, objective for any base quest is slay the kobold, and it's this kobold right here. If I was to kill this kobold, it would in fact complete the quest. I'm going to do that because we don't have any other objectives or anything else set up. And so just give me a second. Maybe I shouldn't miss so much. I don't know why I'm missing so much. And one sec. There we go. All right. So you can see that I've done a little bit of deco through this entire space. I have a lot more to do. You can see that um, this is the initial entryway that we've gone to. I've put a little amphitheater. I'll go ahead and put something behind this to make this look a little bit more like a doorway. I put up some pillars. I've gone ahead and uh, put up a little bit of a cathedral ceiling because there's a story regarding it. And I'll probably do something where this is partially broken out. So that's theoretically where the dragon has flown out of the area. I'm going to probably switch up this specific asset um, because uh, I don't know if it's going to be working quite as well as I sort of want it to, but this is at least a decent first pass. Um, the idea for this is that this space, uh, there's going to be a conversation point here, and what's going to happen is this dimension door is going to open up and you're going to end up in... The, uh, the new location. Um, that location is here. Uh, we'll probably have to swap up some of these doors uh, because they don't quite match up with the stone, but I'll take a look at that uh, as we sort of go. And as you can see, what I've done is essentially added a whole bunch of different wall textures and wall pieces, including some things which uh, do go up. Um, one of the ideas is that uh, we really, when we're trying to do city stuff, we try to really do a depth of uh, uh, make it feel like it's a higher uh, space and sort of like have a good level of sort of uh, distance and also sort of building on building because that's a lot of how the architecture for that space comes out. Um, uh, so the ceiling itself, going back to that space, uh, to answer Sean's question, uh, is uh, is essentially that ceiling... Uh, is a part of one of our other sets. It's called the Cathedral set, uh, and so we're we're just using this. Uh, the idea for this dungeon is that essentially what it is is you're going through sort of open air market portions and then going through sort of side tunnels and alleys to the location. Um, as you can see, as we sort of move through, what I've done is taking a couple of different pieces. There's some verticality to it, and one of the ideas that we'll probably end up doing is uh, this area here will probably 
have some sort of uh, interaction with an NPC. We talked about a couple of the NPCs that you have to deal with. And the idea is that we're going to probably have to do a decent amount of gating uh, between each of these different sections. Um, and one of the reasons why I like having it in open air is like in this section, what I might be able to do is I might be able to have the kitty dragon do a flyover or something like that as players sort of come out of this space. Like if you can just see it kind of flap open, uh, flap over or stuff like that. Um, will the area... Uh, yes, uh, the idea is that uh, we have a whole bunch of different broken assets. There'll be sections which are pristine and there'll be sections where the kitty dragon might be uh, pretty bad. One of the ideas that I had is maybe having the kitty dragon roosted up here and a couple of broken statues or be dropping statues on uh, some some people which are fleeing around. But uh, all these different spaces sort of allows me to do like hey, this will be a one-person encounter. Maybe this is where an ambush comes out of and players can go into. Uh, and sort of the reason why there are a lot of also pathways is I want to give the sense that there are, uh, like, the city has a whole bunch of different optional stuff, even though I'm trying to draw you to the next section or area where you're going. Uh, this will be a nice little, like, back alley stuff. That might be a good place for one of the optional bosses that we sort of talk to. Um, but yeah, the idea is that essentially the the Kitty Dragon will have rampaged through a bunch of it, but there might be a few assets which are in decent states of repair. Um, this space here might be a good space to blow out uh, a back section and maybe put in an optional. Um, and essentially the idea is what we're going is we're going from outdoor to indoor alleyways. This is something pretty reminiscent to what we did in... Uh, uh, in the, uh, I'm trying to remember the name, uh, in essentially the Plague Dungeons, and uh, especially the one that I made, which had a lot of indoor and outdoor sections of it. The nice thing about this is that this is actually the uh, area that you saw that I was building. Um, you could see that I, essentially I put another piece up here to give it a little more verticality, and you can kind of see how each of these pieces give it depth as we go up. I'll probably put a number of these types of spaces up here, and then some of them might have like towers or things in the distance. Oh, uh, quarantine, in quarantine. Uh, well, both quarantine and red rain, I kind of done it in a couple different places. Um, so running through the space, this is going to definitely be the area where I, uh, I roll on. Uh, this is definitely going to be a straight space where I could probably do the large ball of yarn. Um, I've got a couple of different optional uh, sideway passages before we get people uh, to the end. I'll probably put some sort of shield or something like this so that uh, the <clears throat> after rolling over anybody which is down here or something like this, it's going to the, the ball of yarn will end here. This is sort of a placeholder. I'll probably uh, change up the art and make this a, a sort of pool of uh, milk coming out and stuff like that and uh, going from there. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, it's nice to see a bunch of people uh, joining us. It's always great to see Strim Tom, always great to see Druid's Fire, Arc Anniverse, all you folks. It's nice to see you out and about. Um, so where am I planning on putting the secrets? Well, I don't know how much of that I'm going to show. I will probably put a little bit of it so that people can see uh, a little bit how we decide where a secret area is. We always try to do um, at least one locked chest and uh, probably every other dungeon we try to do some uh, some trap stuff. So maybe what I'll do is make one of these side passages in the end or one of the ones in the middle um, lead to an optional which has a little bit of that type of stuff. Um, but uh, also the secret stuff a lot of times is a really larger uh, collaborative effort between the systems team uh, and also the content team determining where we want to put these things, uh, what's the theme of it, how is it going to work, do we have enough time to put stuff, um, how about some traps so you insta-die if a rogue doesn't disable? So that's a great question. Um, however, one of the things that we try to do for the very most part when we're designing uh, traps, when we're designing any of those types of things, is that primary playable path 
we want to make sure is uh, is set up so that players can play it without requiring those things. Optionals are absolutely okay to do so. We have some traps for more punishing than others, uh, but we really try to make sure in this day and age that we don't require a rogue or a trapper in every quest. Now, granted, we can make tougher quests. We can also make different optionals, which allow people to do to sort of push the challenge. But we want to make sure that on that primary path that a solo player can play through it, a, um, a mixed group that doesn't actually have a trapper, uh, someone with a hireling can do it, uh, any of those different options. But um, a while ago, way back when, we re we did push the sort of you have to have a trap person and that causes some problems. There's some good portions about it, about wanting to bring those types of characters around. Um, but also those characters have a great deal of utility and normally do decent DPS and all of that sort of stuff. And so I think a lot of that's kind of covered as a portion. Um, but it's a great question, uh, Raji. Um, all right. Uh, next up, what I'm going to do, now that I've sort of shown you a little bit about this and kind of walked you through, through the space, or at least the work that I've done as a preliminary stuff, um, I'm going to go back to one second while I transition back that way. All right. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start talking about NPCs and scripting NPCs and things of that sort. One of the things that we do as a base portion of pretty much any of uh, our, uh, in the base portion of any of our encounters or any of that stuff, we'll have an amount of NPC scripted. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up uh, my world builder. I'm going to go ahead and show you sort of uh, a quick look on what a character starts with and sort of what a more uh, full starting NPC script looks like and kind of go over the different bits and pieces uh, that we're going to do. All right. Just one second while I go over there. All right. So this is once again, world builder. It's our uh, our proprietary tool. And what I'm going to be showing you a little bit more about is our scripting and our scripting languages. Um, in this particular case, uh, each of our objects or entities have an opportunity to have scripts attached. These scripts can do a wide array of different things. And a lot of times uh, they're used from any, our scripting system is really robust. It's used from anything from uh, some of our animation stuff is done through script uh, or a bunch of it's done through script. Uh, a bunch of our um, appearance stuff is also can be done through script, but also a lot of our talking and sort of uh, the way that we do NPC interactions is done through script. Um, a base script, when we look at one, uh, I made a couple of uh, basic uh, NPCs. Uh, this right here is the, uh, the flavor Kitty Dragon Argo start. Uh, I just named him. As uh, Argonessing character start, I have not dressed him up, haven't done any of that sort of stuff. Um, but when I go into an S script, uh, there are a couple of different types of scripts. There's a uh, there's a server script, uh, there's a normal script, and a normal script will run both on client and server. An S script will only run on the server, and client scripts will only run clients. Um, anything that you want to affect everybody in an area, you don't. Just do in the client, uh, you have to do it either in regular scripts or server scripts. Uh, that's a little bit about that. But uh, in this case, uh, what we're doing is we're looking at uh, a, a dialogue or a dialogue tree uh, that an NPC has. Um, when a player goes up and uses this NPC, uh, you can see that there is a script on them um, and it's usage at usable on use. What this means is that uh, a player can click on this NPC as long as it's set up to be interactable. Um, when, you, when you actually interact with him, it will run anything in here. In this case, a collection, this collection, what that means is that uh, nothing happens. It's just sort of a holding location. Um, there's some other uses for collections. It can be used 
or grouping stuff, but for the most part, it just is an indication that nothing has happened and we'll keep this particular script open. Um, in the other thing, or in the other window, what I have is a more full featured script. Uh, it's it says this particular uh, NPC is uh, featured at the beginning of the Dread Dungeon. Uh, essentially, it's the one uh, the the Triceratops Dungeon, and you can see a little bit more information in this. Now, as you can see, uh, there's sort of a hierarchy for how our scripts work. Um, a lot of times, there are different uh, options and different uh, properties and things like that uh, that we uh, go ahead and put in, in into it. And in this case. We have something called content phase. What AI content phase is used for is if I take this NPC and want to place them in several different places in uh, in a area, and I want to have different interactions with them at different locations, I can still use the same base uh, character, but I just have to change this property on each individual one. In this case, because uh, there weren't any call for that, it's just on the default layer. Um, now, going from there, what it means is that on use, if the content phase is default, it will give you this talking option. I'll go ahead and move this a little bit. And it says, thank you so much for coming. Um, the slash n slash n, uh, what that means is a paragraph break. Anytime we have them, you'll sometimes see uh, You'll see the wrong ways every once in a while on Lamani and stuff like that when we've done a little oopsie when we're scripting. But this is essentially being like, thank you so much for coming. I was able to track down several sets. Now, this is a conversation node. And essentially, below it are any response ports. If I wanted to add additional response ports, I could by just right clicking and uh, selecting add response port. But in this case, it's a pretty linear dialogue. So there's only one to go. Um, uh, this is talking about what were the tracks and essentially this is talking about uh, the entire conversation tree here. Um, and then what happens is, is at the end of it, there is a, uh, is essentially what the, and these are, this is what the NPC is saying. This is the player option of what they're going to respond with. This is what the NPC is saying, and this is what the player will respond with. These can get much more complicated, especially if you have multiple options or things like that. For my starting NPCs, a lot of times, unless there's a whole bunch of different uh, bits that I need to cover, I tend to do this sort of style. Um, I might, in this case, uh, I may use this to begin with, and then a little bit later, we may add a couple of different options to give a little more background information or things like that. Um, but one of the nice things about our script system is that if you find one that you like, uh, like this one here, uh, uh, when uh, what this will do is when this completes, it will run a couple, a series of things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab this. I'm going to copy it and paste it. And the reason why I'm doing that is, let's say, is because this way I have the entire branching setup of a dialogue tree. But if I was to load in, it would be saying the exact same things that that particular NPC said. Uh, how do we come up with what uh, what to write for each NPC? Um, there's sort of a story format for a bunch of these things. There are some uh, rules and guidelines that essentially were given. Um, but a lot of times what we want to try to do is make sure that we're setting the idea of what's going on in the place, a little bit of background information for what's going on, and what are the next steps that a player wants to do. Um, and that's really up to the individual dungeon designer on how verbose or how much information and also sort of the depth of sort of complexity of the storytelling that we want to do. In this, in this case, a lot of times when I'm doing this initial NPC, I really just want to reiterate what's what the uh what the story quest outside the dungeon was saying uh tell players the problem and then uh, give them additional information uh, for this and then one of the other portions when we get back into the actual dungeon portions of that um we can do stuff like uh 
I will then reiterate, at least in short form, what was said in this, so that if you didn't interact with N this NPC, you have an idea of the conversation or at least a brief short form of it. Um, can NPCs have different actions depending on the player? Uh, yes. Um, what we can do is anytime we want to, um, we have the ability to put in what is called a switch. This here is a switch on a content phase. We can switch on a wide array of different things, including uh, NPCs, um, uh, th their class, their race, all of that type of stuff. We can go ahead and and uh, we can do switches on that. Some of our classes have that stuff, some of them don't. Um, we can also do stuff like, um, we can do ability checks, we can do a wide array of different stuff inside this to allow you to make those decisions and sort of have those pathways of going through. This specific one is a little more uh, straightforward, but yeah, if we wanted to, we could do uh, an elf thing. It would probably be an or statement because a lot of, it, it, we don't have generic elves. We would have to select every race and sub race that we wanted to do. So it would be like elf and elf and elf and elf. Um, well, um, one of the challenges when we're doing dungeons, uh, Sean, that's a great point. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, one of the challenges is that we want to make sure that players have a similar experience and being taken out of a combat situation or something like that isn't something that we normally would specifically do uh, in the case of that. But I understand why you would want to do that. But for like the long-term health of the encounter and how the encounter would resolve, it would be a little bit challenging to do that sort of thing. Um, especially if you're the only NPC, uh, you're the only player and you're a warforged in a space. One of the challenges, uh, I'll kind of segue into something. One of the challenges when we're making decisions for dungeons, there's a wide array of different things that we have to think of. How does this specific encounter play with a single player? How does it play with a multi-group player? How does it, uh, if it's something that one player can do and others can't, what do we have other players doing at that specific time? And how can we make them feel included or engaged in in one way or another. All of those things are really important things to do while you're doing uh, specific dungeons. Um, so I figured I'd go over that. Uh, now I'm going to come on back and uh, start actually writing this script for this specific thing. Honestly, what I'm going to do to begin with is I can go ahead and save this. Um, I'm going to just save it as it is. Uh, I will eventually go back. Uh, I, I'm going to go back and do a bunch of different things. But what I'm going to do is... Uh, give me two seconds. Let me go back to this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to process some files. Uh, and so you can actually see uh, sort of the result of the work that I did um, as a portion of this... MPC. All right. What I'm going to do is do this. I'm going to transition over here so that you can see that this MPC here. And then what I'm going to do is go to the next uh, space. Uh, it didn't teleport me right. So let's try that again. One second. Let's see. It's always great when. All right. So let's go back to this while I fix this up. All right. So right now, what's happening is I'm going to go ahead and process that change. What that will do is that we'll have that NPC use, in fact, the other NPC's complete string table stuff. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to actually place it in the scene and I'm going to have you have it so that we can take a look and uh, see it in client and see how it acts and how it interacts. Um, and then I'm going to do a few other things uh, and show you sort of 
the bits and pieces as we build this. Um, one of the other things I'm going to do is also write the dialogue as we go along. Um, let's see. Give me a few moments while I put this together. Uh, do folks have other questions, or is there anything uh, that they you have regarding uh, the stuff that I've shown you so far? Uh, yes. Uh, Prisoners of the Plane is definitely one of the places where we've done a whole bunch of different pieces of this type of scripting where uh, only lawful characters can interact or get a different uh, reaction or interaction with stuff. Um, Prisoners of the Plains is, is really a kind of great quest, and I'm glad that we've, you know, that we've had a chance to do it. Like, we've had a chance to have that sort of breadth of different types of content. Some content's going to be a little more straightforward. Some of it's going to be a little less. Um, I am wearing what is unfortunately a little bit faded, but I believe that this is a Feywild expansion uh, t-shirt. Um, for most of the different expansions, we get at least some sort of swag. Uh, behind me, you can see, uh, sorry, on this side over here, uh, you can see the Isle of Dread. Uh, we actually got a print of some of the stuff. Uh, and so this is one of the ones that I had. Uh, it's a little fade, more faded than I would have liked, but, you know, that's kind of how it goes. All right. So let's go. What I'm going to do is we're going to transition back over to here. And this is that first room. And one of the things that I know I'm going to do is I'm going to place that NPC. And that process is done by using essentially this world editor, which has uh, a wide array of our different characters uh, and essentially all of the placeable objects that we can place into our game are all stored here. So if I go into the Kitty Dragon folder, um, uh, essentially you can look through and see, this is the NPC that I was working on. This is Argo Start. Uh, we'll go ahead and zoom in. You can see that that's the same NPC. Uh, for any uh, generated object, what we need to do is we need to have a generator. Um, there are a couple different types of generators. Uh, in this case, there are ones that spawn one thing only. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to paste that. And a lot of our... Uh, the way that we do a lot of our scripting is actually through an interface and actually uh, is object oriented. So in this particular case, what I can do is uh, I have a whole bunch of different options. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and do generator output into generator input. Uh, sorry. Generator output to Why didn't it do that? But okay, so what, when you look at a generator, there are a whole bunch of different options that we have as a portion of it. In this particular case, um, uh, what we have here is generator is inactive false. That essentially means that when you first spawn into the space, is this NPC going to be here? Uh, in this case, we're going to go ahead and have that happen. And we're going to go ahead and save that. So what's going to happen is when players spawn in at this location, uh, I can go ahead and delete that because we no longer need the NPC. We can have this NPC is going to spawn in here. Uh, I'm going to show you a little bit more about this as I kind of go through and kind of talk through the, the scripts. But uh, this NPC will now show up when I go ahead and build. Now, looking at this NPC, I can go ahead and bring up that script that we had, and you can see that I have all of that information here. Now, a while ago, when I was talking, I mentioned something called string tables. Pretty much what this says here in this specific dialogue is this is our string table error. And what it does is it shows us that if I am talking to this specific NPC, 
Uh, these are all the different conversation portions that this person's going to be doing. However, in this case, this is referring to a Dread NPC, and that's not where we're going to be saving all of this stuff. What I'm going to do is I'm going to point to a different file so that all of our string table stuff is, is set and built sort of for uh, best practices sake uh, in a location where people doing text editing and stuff can find it. So what I'll do is go here, go flavor. And in this case, um, go to kitty dragon. And then this is the NPC. And what I can do is I can do uh, intro start underscore. And I can type this is the starting dialogue. And hit OK. And what this is going to do is this is going to build this as that first dialogue. This is now saved in another place. Um, I'm going to go ahead and save that change. And what I'm doing right now is essentially going through each individual one uh, and I'm setting up uh, a stub or at least a sort of fabricated version so you can take a look and see um, how this is the first response. So I'm going to do this. And so this is the starting dialogue. This is the response one that leads to the next one, which will be and do intro start the tools themselves. If you leave a thing, we'll, we'll enumerate them so that there'll be a, a number after them so that each of these will be different bits. So what we're going to do is going to be uh, follow up one. Okay. And then what we're going to do here is we're going to do last. Response two. Last start response three. And one of the things that I have to be very careful about is that I'm actually changing the specific uh, dialogue and going into the correct uh, sp specific string table, or I'm going to actually be changing the data for the other game. For, for the other NPC in the other game. Every once in a while, you'll see a string table get swapped out. That's exactly how it happens. Uh, last, and in this case, we'll go uh, start and this. The ending response. Okay, now let's take a look to see what this does. All right, so we have a pre, uh, a dungeon event set up called intro and, excuse me, intro NPC. Uh, we'll go ahead and save this. And then there's this for finish one. All right, the reason why I'm remembering this is because essentially, uh, there's some scripting stuff that I'm going to do. I'm going to show you that in a couple of seconds. I just want to try to remember what I did here. So finish one. So we're going to save this and go ahead and build this. Transition over to here. And then what I can show you after this takes a couple of seconds, I can show you in notepad plus plus the effect of what I've just done. I have to draw up flow charts before I started this coding. Uh, it's one of those things is that as time goes along, you actually get used to the object oriented section of this and how 
each thing pieces together. And there's some basic code objects which are used from place to place, which are really helpful uh, because they get an opportunity and they kind of show you, you, you get used to the process of what you're doing. Um, so one of the things I want to show you is this real quick. You can see that that tool um, has the name of the MPC, but also all of those responses are stored in this specific file. In this case, response one is response one, response two is response two, this is the opening up, this is follow one, and this is uh, poorly named, and I'll go ahead and update that eventually, but we'll go from there. Uh, all right, so what I'm going to do next is open this back up. As you can see, it's sort of a multi-stage process. I kind of want to, I know this is kind of getting into the weeds a little bit, but like these are each of the basic interactions when we're trying to make an NPC do something pretty basic as a course, uh, as a portion of this. Uh, in this case, sec while my tools are loading. Let's go over here. All right. So, all right. So we're back with that MPC is set up and all of that sort of stuff. Now, this is the waypoint out. One of the things that I'm gonna to wanna to do is not allow players to leave until they talk to this NPC. Um, one of the ways that I'm going to go ahead and do so is something interesting. So let's uh, space. All right, so what I'm gonna to need to do, I know as a portion of what I wanna do, is have this character have a conversation. Um, I know that this character here has a, a series of conversation points. Um, I messed up a little bit on it, but that's all right. I'll kind of go back and fix the, the response. I think the response three is poorly named, um, but I'll go ahead and fix that in a little bit. It's not a huge deal, uh, but really what I wanna show you is this portion here. Um, what this is, is this is telling, uh, one of the cool things that we have is we have a number of different objects. Those specific objects do a number of different uh, things in the game. In this case, uh, we have something called a lever master. A lever master is an object which is used as sort of a, a control thing. Uh, I can put a link into it and then it could tell something else to do it. This is really helpful when I'm trying to uh, have one action from an NPC or from a monster dying or something like that, do a number of different things. This is sort of for making it a little cleaner and also being a little more visibly uh, understandable if someone else was to look into your space or work in your space or things of that sort. So in this case, what I'm gonna do is find second, I'm gonna look over here here the logic and we have a logic lever master and the entire purpose of this really is to make the scripting of this cleaner if someone else was to look at this so in this case what i'm going to do is i'm going to put a script out from this person and here in this case script output link in script and put so if we go back and look at this scripting, this here tells you uh, that lever master open one, what this is gonna do is this, as long as this is named this, it will run this on this object. So as long as the link here, which we have a way of naming our links, is named finish one,
this, because it's named this, will run that on this. What Lever Master set open one essentially tells it to do something. In this case, these are all the different options. So on open one, what I'm going to do is tell this generator to activate. And then what I'm going to do is make sure that this generator is set to inactive, which means that when a player spawns in, uh, they won't uh, they won't be able to or they won't have an option to uh, to step into this gate until they finish this basic conversation. So the idea is essentially that this is this entire thing is a script that runs to this to this to turn this on, um, and that's the teleport uh, mechanic. Uh, if you give me just one second, I'm going to go ahead and uh, build that, and then I'm going to show you in client just so you can see that this is sort of the basic building blocks when we're actually doing scripting of how this entire system works. It's super flexible. It gives us a lot of ability to uh, to do a wide array of different uh, options. And these specific scripts can do a wider array of different stuff. Uh, it can have someone do an emote. It could have someone, uh, it can have monsters do emote. It can turn on or off different bits and pieces. Uh, so I just kind of want to show you this one part. And then this, the next thing I'm going to go back to is um, I'm going to show you what that dungeon event thing is. Um, because the idea is that this specific NPC is supposed to uh, start the entire chain of what the players are doing uh, over the course of uh, over the course of the uh, adventure. Uh, all right, just give me one second while you bring up the client. Uh, do folks have any questions about the stuff that we're doing right now? Um, I know it's a little uh, it's a little technical. It's a little bit in the weeds. It's uh, a little bit of what we do on our day to day when we're building an interaction of this sort or when we're getting this. So like what this could also do is spawn a whole bunch of different enemies. It could uh, turn on a series of traps. It could open doors. It could do all of those different types of stuff. Um, as you get used to working in the tools and the tool set, it kind of you get an, you get an idea and a flow and you can put together things pretty quickly. Um, and in, in fact, a little bit quicker than uh, in some of the other tool sets that I've worked with. Uh, all right, let's go here and let's see. And then we'll go over here and we'll once again hop in and see what I've done. Yeah. Um, one of the best parts about this entire tool set is the flexibility. And also, um, as you can tell, a lot of this doesn't require specific engineering or it doesn't require specific uh, coding knowledge. It, it requires some scripting, but it doesn't require me to actually go into C++ or into any of the other different things to build content. And so people which don't have an engineering background or things like that, have an opportunity to work on this game and do a, a great deal of different stuff. Um, how long do we think, how long does it take people? So normally what it does is it takes, the first portion of it takes between, uh, I would say two to three months for a person to really be up and running and being more or less self-sufficient as a portion of what we're doing. Um, some of it's a little bit easier. Some of it's a little different. Um, we have one of our designers go through and kind of uh, be like, this is what we're asking you to do. This is the method that we're going to be going about uh, doing it. Um, and here is an example space or something that we want you to work in. Um, a lot of times our newer uh, people work on uh, stuff like uh, our... A night revels dungeon, so things of that stuff. Um, uh, when we do the night revels and all of those different pieces, uh, a lot of times it's a little easier to go into those spaces because we have a little more of a familiarity of what's going on there, and we go from there. All right, so as you can see, 
uh, this guy because he's hooked up to that generator. Oh, I'm going to show one other thing that is kind of neat. Um, what this is, is uh, we have an ability uh, to see objects as they were, would be in World Builder and we can actually interact with them. It's helpful uh, if I wanted to kind of step through this or wanted to, to force any of these things to happen, it allows us to do stuff. So you can see this is the starting dialogue. Uh, we have response one, this is follow up one, this is response three poorly named. And what's going to happen is that that is going to spawn as a portion of what we talked about and sort of the scripting that we did. So um, here, so that's a, uh, so that is sort of the sum total of how we set up that entire piece uh, and interaction. So the next thing we're going to set up uh, give me one second uh, here. The next plan for what I want to do is show you a little bit more about dungeon events and showing you how I'm going to set up the basic dungeon events that we're going to be using as a portion of this entire, uh, for, for this dungeon. Um, these dungeon events are essentially the backbone of how we motivate and move players through the space. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the theory of what I'm going to set up initially and then kind of go from there. And you can see how these different scripting pieces and also sort of what our plan going forward uh, with some of this and how it works uh, will we'll all kind of string together. Um, so to begin with, uh, what I'm going to show you next will be Notepad++. Plus Plus. Over to Notepad++. Plus Plus. We love Notepad++. Plus Plus. Uh, this is the dungeon quest. The dungeon quest, once again, is fully uh, text. This is the currently existing uh, dungeon event of Kill a Kobold. This is what that would look like. Um, however, um, I grabbed another dungeon um, in this particular case. Uh, is the... Uh, is one of the Secrets of the Salt Marsh non-primary path quests. Um, one of the reasons why I do this is a lot of times um, I can go ahead and grab this and actually copy and paste a good deal of this information from one to another. Some of it's not going to work, some of it's going to work. Uh, I will paste this in, and let's see. All right, so my braces look good. And so what I've done is, in fact, taken that first uh, objective and put it into the game. Uh, and it's actually uh, referring back to the uh, classic mini salt dungeon. If if I put this into and launched the server like this and saved it and all of that type of stuff, it would have all of the attributes of that other dungeon. Uh, it would be calling to those files and referring to all those files, but that's not what we're going to do. Um, first thing I have to do is uh, anytime you see a pound sign, um, it's actually us notating uh, out or commenting out a line in the thing. In this case, I'm not going to be using the sound file. Um, now, what I need to do is, since I did copy and paste that, I know that there are a whole bunch of different file references. In this case, what I'm going to do is make sure that it's pointing to the correct string uh, table file. Um, so for the first objective of this quest, what I want to do and what I want to make sure that I do is uh, set up that text here. In this case, um, the text is going to be uh, uh, speak to TBD Argonessin Mage. I can do that. I can do that. Um, so 
what's going to happen is that when you speak to the when you do this scripted event here it's going to give you the dm stuff uh the dm text that writes over here so in this case um uh dnt or tbd asks you to gather objects for the kitty dragon. This is, of course, all placeholder text. I'm going to go through and do an entire uh, loop through this. Uh, to And uh, so ask you to gather objects uh, to contain the kitty dragon. Feed through the portal. All right. Now this, this is something that's set up in World Builder, uh, and I showed you a little bit of how we did that a little while ago. And in this case, what we have is we have a concept called the game callback. That game callback is cb underscore dungeon event dot wc. What that does is that will go ahead and into our quest system push this scripted keyword event, which is also what's referenced here. So in this case, what I'm going to do is that that's intro NPC. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and save this. Go back here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to process that. And what it's going to do is when you enter the dungeon, you will have an objective. That objective, uh, as we wrote, was speak to TBD to be determined Argon SMH. I didn't name them, so I just put the placeholder in. I'll go ahead and fix that up a little bit later. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, add that to data. And so the entire idea is what it is, is it's a single reference. That reference is going into another file. Um, these are both put together in the server and essentially it knows that by running that callback, that CB dungeon event with that name, that intro NPC, it will play this event, this scripted event keyword uh, and advance the quest when that happens. Uh, it's kind of neat. It's, it's sort of a great way to set up these different uh, objects and sort of push them from one to another. So a lot of times when we do things that uh, when you're looking at the game and you see stuff that uh, that essentially updates in your different uh, uh, in your quest panel and you have the options to kind of see all of those types of things, uh, you can go ahead and set that up. Uh, let me make sure that is set up correct. And double check something. Okay. That is correct. All right. One second while I go ahead and watch my client. Uh, do folks have any questions about the stuff that I've been showing you? Uh, do you have any other questions regarding uh, essentially uh, any of the bits uh, of this stuff? Uh, nope. All right. Uh, it'll just be a second while I go ahead and uh, pop us over into the uh, into the actual client. Here we go. Just be a second while uh, the game client comes through. And then we're going to go ahead and tell a queue into the quest.
there. And here we go. And you can see that now this now says speak to uh, TBD argon SMH up over here. And then when we go ahead and speak to the argon SMH uh, and we go through all the dialogue options, uh, it finishes and completes it. Um, when we're, and you can see as a portion of that entire script, as it kind of went through, it opens this up. Um, so the next thing that I'm going to want to do um, is sort of build the structure of what we're going to do for the quest. Um, one of the things that we always try to do is have at least one active objective for players and also a final goal, just to sort of reinforce and uh, kind of go over all of the information uh, regarding uh, uh, regarding the entirety of sort of what we're doing. So in this case, what I'll probably do is uh, the end, I'll probably, the story quest has, so uh, capture the kitty dragon will probably be an ongoing quest objective that is always there until the end of the quest. When you complete that, um, it will be the object that actually finishes the quest itself. So as you can see, this is sort of the start of the entire process of what we're doing. Uh, in this case, uh, let's see. Uh, and you can just see that this, of course, teleports you out. I do, however, have to put a uh, teleport back just in case you need to get to the start of the dungeon. So we'll finish out of this. And let's see. Um, do So yeah, that's a little bit about how we go about building quests and quest objectives. Um, one of the other things that I'm gonna show you real quick um, is that we have a con, uh, sometimes we don't want all of the information or we don't want information to be a part of the quest objective. And so a lot of it is sort of, how do we fill in information surrounding the area or, or sort of what you're seeing before you or give you additional details of uh, what's going on. So what we're gonna do is we're going to start that process. Um, I figure I'll show you this one last thing um, and then we'll probably be done for the evening, but um, what I'm going to show you is we have a process which essentially allows us to, when a player enters a space, it allows the uh, allows a quest to uh, display DM text. And it isn't tied to any of the different pieces, um, or it isn't tied to uh, quest objectives or things of that sort, but it sort of just fills out information for players and also gives them hints about the space. Uh, one of the things that we try to do when players enter a space is if if and when they move forward and sort of uh, go forward in a specific space, they actually get um, get some additional information and maybe a point of where to go for that first objective if you're actually reading all the bits and pieces. So let's go over back to here. So there's a couple of different things that we're gonna need to do. I know that the type, sorry, if this is fast, let's go back. So what I know is that when players teleport in, they're going to teleport into this space, uh, into an area uh, around this space. So what I wanna do is set up the first objective to be a little bit further um, from that so that essentially they get that dialogue, not while they're loading in, because that can kind of uh, cause a problem or two, but essentially as they step forward. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to one of our types of objects here, uh, and it's a DM text trigger volume. And it's named number one. I've in fact placed number one. And one of the benefits for this is that you can see the space surrounding that this will affect. So when a player steps into the space, it will do that thing. 
Uh, I will eventually uh, set it up so that it's a little bit larger. I might actually just do that now. And so this way that a player couldn't like walk beside it. There's no benefit for them doing it, but sometimes it happens. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and set that up. Now, next thing we're going to do is we're going to go over to Notepad++. And what we're going to do is we're going to set up a trigger. All right. So there's a whole bunch of, there's three different types of objectives or uh, dungeon objective types that we have. What we have here are completion conditions. Completion conditions are things with objectives. The second thing that we have as I go down are optional objectives. And that's where we set up any of the optional information. Uh, and then what it is, is quest trigger. I'm going to grab a quest trigger. I'm going to go ahead and paste it down here. I'm going to change this to one because I know that the response is that. Out. And <clears throat> and we know that this uh, large room Agent Arcanesin, Agent of Arcanesin stands on a virtual platform before you, above you, a skylight. Yeah. Shards of glass litter the floor. Looking up, you can see a partially destroyed skylight. Now, there are a number of different things uh, about this statement which I'm going to have to uh, set up. A lot of times what we try to do when we're actually setting up this space is make sure that there's visual information in each of these steps that displays the information that we're talking about. So what I'm going to need to go through is I'm going to need to put shattered uh, glass floor stuff. So surrounding this area, I will probably have to also change the shape of, of it a little bit and also put sort of a ritual circle here. And then up above, I'm going to have to make this look a little more glassy and have like a broken portion of this around so that when players actually do the things that are describing, uh, this leads them looking upwards and this leads to for players to look in front of them, uh, give them a little more context clues of things that may or may not be obvious uh, and also sort of lead them to the next stage. And if there's something specifically you really want to point out, uh, that shattered uh, portion up there is probably a, a good idea. So I'm going to go ahead and save this. And so what's going to happen is that since I have this large object here, this uh, DM uh, volume trigger uh, one, one second. Um, anytime a player walks into this space, it will set that off uh, and, but it's set up to only trigger one. So, uh, so the first player that's gonna do the step forward through that will play that for everyone in the party. Uh, all right, so let's go here. Save this. Process this. All right. 
So yeah, um, that's a little bit of essentially how we build this sort of thing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to build it. I'm going to show you guys this. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, like this is this is a little bit of the actual when we're building a quest, how we build an objective. This is how we build the next stage of what we're doing. And this is us using the tools while we're kind of going through all the different steps as we sort of process this. Um, the next time we get together, I will probably have a bunch more of the objectives put together. Um, and I'll kind of walk, walk you through the entire process that I went and sort of what I'm trying to do as a portion of this is sort of give you an understanding of what I'm going to be working on, what's the next stage that we're sort of on. And in this case, I'm trying to do critical path without monster generation and things of that sort, so that I can kind of get a flow of an idea of how long the space is going to take, if it has all the different pieces that I need to do. Do I need to dr drastically change the shape before I actually put combat encounters um, some of the other things that I'm going to have to consider when looking through the space is that there's going to be need to be gating. Um, there has to be a way to prevent players from grabbing large groups of uh, pods of monsters just on top of each other. And so <clears throat> it has to be like combat break, combat break, combat break. Or players will just run through one and then until you get the, to that first natural stopping point, uh, it stops. So... We have to have ways to prevent that, and so that's going to be one of the other things I'm going to probably talk through and sort of explain the process and sort of the method that we go about uh, describing a bunch of that stuff. Now, let me go ahead and launch this. Yeah, I, I'm i glad that folks uh, are finding this uh, somewhat informative and getting an idea and sense of sort of how our tools work and react and interact. One of the things that I really didn't go into is sort of the breadth and depth of all of the things that the scripting system does. Uh, it handles a wide array of different things, including anything from uh, character abilities and things of that stuff. Um, and also, a lot of times it's used as the basic building block of how we build content uh, across the board. Um, but it is kind of fun that, like, as you can see, I didn't program anything in this. I didn't actually set up any of those different pieces uh, in a way in something that, you know, someone who doesn't have a background in engineering or things of that sort, as long as they have a kind of uh, understanding of how, um, an understanding of how, what the relationship of objects are to each other and sort of naming conventions and stuff like that, how we actually put this stuff together. I mean, I've been lucky enough to do this for a number of different years. I've been lucky enough to work on a number and a variety of different projects um, here at SSG and elsewhere. But this tool set really gives us a lot of flexibility and allows us to put stuff together in a pretty quick and understandable manner. Now, sometimes things are a little more fancy. Sometimes things are a little more uh, are are a little more complex. But the basic building blocks of how we do this is sort of setting up and all of these different pieces. Um, so you can see that this is gonna be a TBD speak to mage. When I walk forward, an ancient arc in essence stands in front of you, ritual before you, shards of glass go to the floor, looking up, you can see that. And so you can see that that's how all of that stuff comes together. So now if I talk to him, as I showed you before, this is the ending response. TBD mage asks you to gather objects, in the kitty dragon, proceed through the portal. Uh, and then there you go. As you can see, that's a little bit of an overview of what we're going to be doing. Um, what I'm going to do uh, between now and the next stream is probably uh, populate a whole bunch of different uh, dungeon objectives uh, and sort of set up a couple of different pieces of that. Maybe next time what I'll do is uh, show a little more of a scripting fun stuff or uh, some stuff which uh, we'll probably need to get into, which is like, how do I make the dragon appear? How do I make it fly over? How do I make it so that players can perceive all of that sort of stuff? And what are ways that I use sort of the space itself to draw players to the next objective? Um, that's some of the stuff that I kind of want to talk about next time. Um, but thank you so much for joining uh, 
joining uh, joining me for today um, for the joy of devving with uh, Bob Hess. Um, I go by uh, I I go by No Bob on all my social media. Feel free to check it out. Um, but I'm so glad that I got an opportunity to show you a little bit more about the uh, uh, you know just about the tools, how we go about working on different things, how we go about building different stuff, and the next uh, couple steps. I hope you folks have a lovely evening and uh, take care.